Well, good morning, colleagues. You're all looking remarkably bouncy after what I've heard about last night's dinner. Of course, the other way to tackle that challenge of telling the wife where you are is what peers do in the House of Lords, which is you register first thing in this morning to get your allowance. So you say you're at the NIA conference, and I presume you then get your CPD points, but they never know what you've done after that. <laughs> right, on with the show. I'd like to start with a new build of my own from 300 years ago, given where we are meeting. It's the story of the first Westminster Bridge, the precursor of today's bridge. The first proposal for a new Westminster Bridge was put forward in the late 1600s. And unsurprisingly, the idea was swiftly rejected. It was then revived again in 1721, but actual work on the bridge, spades in the ground in CBI language, didn't begin until 1738. So it took about 40 years to move from idea to implementation, about the same time as life expectancy at that time. It just goes to show that even three centuries later, infrastructure projects are still notoriously difficult to get off the ground. But it also shows, whether it's a bridge or a nuclear power station, that we have to think long term, in decades and even centuries, not in years or in months. So it's a real pleasure for me to be asked to give an address this morning at this conference and to discuss these generational issues. I'd like to talk a bit about the challenge of infrastructure investment in general, the need for nuclear in particular, and the opportunities this can bring for business, including many of your businesses, through supply chains. So let me start by setting out the challenge. Just a week ago, when I met George Osborne to talk about what the CBI and business needed to see in the government's budget, I presented him a five-point plan for investment, made up of supporting medium-sized businesses, the British Mittelstand that I bang on about quite a lot because I believe it's a sweet spot in British economic growth, Investing in talent, because just at the moment, wherever I go, entrepreneurs say to me the biggest challenge they're facing is talent and skill shortage. Encouraging innovation, building up exports, and crucially, improving our infrastructure. Why do I mention this? Because it's important to stress that infrastructure investment isn't an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And that subtlety sometimes gets lost in the debate. It's a means to a more competitive, productive, and well-balanced economy. Yet year after year after year, this country has underinvested in infrastructure. Even in the good times, we've neglected one of our most important assets, spending just over half of what countries like France spend on their national infrastructure. As a result, a substantial gap has emerged over decades that leaves the UK lagging behind. So what's the answer? Well, with government expenditure constrained, filling this gap with public money simply hasn't been an option. At any point over the last five years, the famous parliament of austerity, and frankly, I don't see that getting any better looking forward. Private finance will have to fill the gap. So much of what I've done during my five years as Director General has been about trying to leverage private finance for public good in the new financial normal. That in turn makes it even more important than ever that we give investors the confidence they need to invest. Investors who are increasingly all over the globe. So it's also made the work between government and business, between government and your industry, part of a global debate about investment choices, as many of you well know. Now, on this point, our performance has improved in the last five years. I don't need to tell you about how the work that we all did to get UK guarantees over the line was a critical part of getting Hinkley C over the line. But it doesn't stop here. The increased commercial awareness within Infrastructure UK 
as the government entity that we need to work with, the continual improvements in the National Infrastructure Plan as we've turned it over that five-year period from a wish list to something we would recognize in business as a genuine investment plan, and groundbreaking innovations like the Green Investment Bank that took time to get over the line but are increasingly making innovative investments in the market. All of these have helped to make the UK a more attractive investment location for the private sector. What's more, the market's come a long way since 2012 when I was lobbying the Chancellor to get UK guarantees because the challenge at that time was a lack of availability of capital. Now, thankfully, we're seeing a healthy appetite from a range of investors, traditional bank sources, but also institutional investors such as insurers and pension schemes, which means it's harder for me to use the quip I was using three years ago as to why the Ontario Teachers' Pension Scheme seemed to be doing more in Britain's infrastructure than the City of London. That's no longer the case, thank goodness. The pipeline is now working, the city has found a route to market. And in that regard, I'm pretty positive about the outlook. But our failure to invest in infrastructure has also been a failure to take big political decisions. Investment climate's important. Global attitudes are important. Pipeline is critical. Bringing commercial and political cultures together so Infrastructure UK can do market deals is important. But we still need politicians to make the big decisions. A failure to develop political consensus has been a weakness in our infrastructure policy, as has a failure to see decisions through. And it's ironic we should be meeting this morning, because that's nowhere better illustrated by the debate about runway capacity in the southeast of England. And now my old boss, Howard Davis, one of my predecessors as Director General of the CBI, has laid his golden egg and said, we do need an extra runway in the southeast of England, and in his judgment, the place to build it is Heathrow. My message to government is very clear. Don't cherry pick his report. Don't dither and procrastinate. Get diggers on the ground at Heathrow by 2020 by making a decision now to go ahead with his proposals. Indeed, you might say that political certainty has been the missing piece in the infrastructure puzzle. Not just for investors, but for those charged with building and operating our infrastructure, from asset owners to those in the construction supply chain. In few places is this need for political certainty more obvious than in energy. After a period of inevitable instability, which is par for the course in the run-up to any general election, government now needs to help inspire confidence in consumers and in investors alike, whether we're talking about the retail or the wholesale market. Business wants a balanced energy mix which keeps the lights on, emissions down, and costs manageable. And nuclear, in my judgment, is absolutely critical to all of these. A balanced energy mix, keeping emissions down, and keeping costs manageable. Looking back, as you well know, nuclear has provided around 20% of our generation mix, providing low carbon, secure energy for decades. But looking forward, as you equally know, well know, all but one of our existing fleet of nuclear power stations are set to close by the middle of the next decade. Unless we act now, we're entering the end times of nuclear power, and we're simply not going to let that happen. But we take too long to get the new generation of capacity through the political and planning system. Add to this the effects of closing old coal and gas plants, and you're looking at a huge strain on the system. And you know as well as I that Ofgem talked in balanced terms to keep confidence among the public up. But they still need to tell us that UK capacity margins are down to 3% in the coming winter. And whilst measures are in place to deal with this, for me, frankly, that's a bit too close for comfort. We've had to introduce new measures, 
such as supplemental balancing reserve and demand side balancing reserve to manage the problem in the short term. So we can handle it. There isn't a crisis. But we shouldn't ever have been in this situation. And when I see on the 10 o'clock news an energy minister saying it's absolutely fine, and then I see the chief executive of Sheffield Forge Masters saying, when the minister says it's absolutely fine, what he means is I close down my factory when it needs to be absolutely fine. I think the public knows which of those two is closer to the truth. Demand side measures are fine, but they're not a long-term solution. In the medium to long term, there's no substitute for more investment in the system. Replacing existing nuclear power plants will be essential for providing clean, based load power to help meet our energy challenges. Now that pretty much a statement of the blindingly obvious. But one of the services I think the CBI has played in the energy debate is we brought the user community with us in this debate about nuclear power. You played a critical role. I remember in persuading Tony Blair when he was Prime Minister to commit to new nuclear. But what really got it over the line was it wasn't just the obvious suspects. In any CBI regional meeting, it was small and medium-sized companies whose only interest in this energy infrastructure debate is that they're users of power and they just want predictability of availability and price of power. It was those companies that were saying to politicians that they couldn't envisage an energy mix, a balanced and secure energy mix that didn't have nuclear as part of the solution. Never mind the fact that there's simply no way, in my judgment, we'll hit our carbon targets, our long-term carbon targets, without nuclear. So government is right to take action to support this sector and getting this right to the top of the new Secretary of State's to-do list is part of my job. The first stop on this journey, as I know you've been discussing for the last 24 hours, will be Hinkley Point C, the first nuclear power station in a generation, providing clean energy for 5 million homes. And getting Hinkley right will fire the starting gun on new nuclear for the rest of the new nuclear fleet. Yet whilst this may feel like a no-brainer, we can't be complacent. To deliver this vision, we need to continue making the case, holding politicians to account and making sure it doesn't fall off the radar. And especially for Hinkley Point, we need to make sure that the UK government takes up the challenges coming from other countries, other countries in Europe, by staunchly defending the UK's right to pursue its own energy mix choices because that is not generally accepted across all of Europe. The European Commission has said that energy mix must remain a member state competence. We need to stick with what's working, but that isn't what every member state thinks. It makes sense to stick closely to the current UK guarantee, given it has support of industry and has already received state aid approval. And we must make sure that that UK guarantee scheme, when it runs out, is replaced by a similar scheme. And we also, in my judgment, from our politicians, need to see an extension of the levy control framework. Given that this is the funding pot from which different payments will be drawn, an extension will be crucial to make sure that Hinckley isn't an only child and that new deals are stuck, struck with other power stations. Now, many of you will know, if you're in the public policy game, that the levy control framework currently runs to 2020 stroke 21. Nuclear projects will go well, well beyond that. Having an idea of the total funds committed by government will be crucial for investor confidence in the UK's commitment to decarbonisation. But with these infrastructure changes, especially when it comes to nuclear, come significant opportunities. So as so often, in a CBI narrative. We have political challenges and commercial opportunities. In the UK, industry has set out plans to deliver 16 gigawatts of new nuclear by 2030. Roughly 12 nuclear reactors at the five sites we've earmarked. 
For the geeks among you, and I'm not one, I have to admit, here's a factoid too good to check, as Boris Johnson often says in speeches. 16 gigawatts of power is, I am reliably informed, equivalent to eight Hoover dams, which is rather easier to sell to the great British public. Or 6,400 wind turbines, equivalent to all the on and offshore turbines across the UK today. But of course, it's not just the end destination of energy security that will help our economy. The journey also gives us huge growth opportunities. As we grow our nuclear industry, we'll see new opportunities for firms to become involved in that supply chain, particularly those Mittelstand companies, the medium-sized businesses that I'm so interested in, and opportunities for new entrants. And new entrants alongside established players are an important part of a dynamic economy. Today, the UK's nuclear sector has a total commercial turnover, I think, of around £4 billion. And delivering those 16 gigawatts of new capacity will require about £60 billion of investment, with Oxford Economics and Atkins suggesting that the UK supply chain could capture 60% of that value. And on my arithmetic, but it's a long time since I went to school, that would be about £36 billion. The scale of this opportunity, given that the UK hasn't built a nuclear power station for a generation, is a real indication of the strength and ingenuity of British industry. But to make sure we don't miss out on our slice of the pie, we must help our supply chains gear up to what will be Europe's largest construction project. And here I turn briefly to industrial strategy because that's the way you support business in doing this. We've been long-standing supporters in the CBI of the new industrial strategy, a 21st century approach to how government and business work together, a major step forward in thinking. We've seen real benefits from sectors like automotive and aerospace, which hit the ground with this collaborative approach earliest. The Economist has reported that in those sectors, productivity is now 56% higher than the pre-crisis levels. And overall, across all the sectors covered by industrial strategy, several billion pounds of new investment has been unlocked because CEOs have gone into a room taking their company hats off and putting their sector hats on and thought, irrespective of who owns the company, what's actually good for UK PLC. Two billion pounds of co-funding from business and government in the Advanced Technology Institute, one billion of co-funding in the Advanced Propulsion Centre. Of course, nuclear is one of the 11 areas covered by industrial strategy, and I think some great work's been done by the Nuclear Industry Association in pushing forward with this. Indeed, in the last parliament, we've seen some really encouraging signs. So just as I need to see government ministers commit to nuclear, and just as I need to see government ministers commit to the Davis report on runway capacity, I need to see government ministers commit to this approach to how you work jointly between government and business in the 21st century. Colleagues, as I started my speech by looking back to the past, Westminster Bridge and 1721, it's only right that I finish by looking forward to the future. Unlike Westminster Bridge, we can't afford to wait another 40 years or even another five years to act. We have to act now. We need to create an environment which really attracts investment in infrastructure, which allows the private sector to be part of the solution. We need to make the most of nuclear at Hinkley Point and elsewhere. And we need to make sure that UK business in the supply chain has the right support, the right skills, and the right specialist knowledge to make the most of this opportunity. This is a big ticket CBI issue. This is how you grow an advanced industrial economy in the 21st century. You get behind cutting edge infrastructure. I look forward to working with you to make this goal a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, John. Um, just some of the things that I wanted to pick up on what you're talking about, investment being one of them, which you talked about private finance uh, needing to fill the gap. Where do you think the confidence is going to come from in business to encourage more investment again? Because that's really been an issue, hasn't it, as you say, over the last few years? 
So one of the challenges we've had in this great economic debate of how you get growth moving at a state and a time of austerity is our national statistics have not really kept pace with what's really happening in the market. So until pretty much this time last year, the view was that business wasn't investing. And I could never understand that because I was constantly meeting CEOs who were busy investing. And then the ONS changed their back series of data on business investment, and they've shown business investment has been of the order of 30% of economic growth, pretty much in the run-up since from 2010. So the business investment figures have actually been more healthy. So let's look more specifically at where there's been grit where there's been grit in the system. And it's had a lot to do with greenfield and brownfield sites. It's had a lot to do with persuading pension funds and other long-term investors which investments they can get involved in that are safe. And it's had a lot to do in the financial new normal, I think, with finding new ways to balance up the role of long-term investors with the cutting-edge role of bank finance in the most high-risk part of the investment. But I think what's really interesting for me now, we checked this at the last meeting of the CBI Infrastructure Board only last week. The role of UK guarantees is changing. In 2012, we needed UK guarantees to get triple B credit rating to triple A, because otherwise nothing would happen. Actually, now there are many people in the city saying the danger with UK guarantees is they might crowd out private sector investment. That's a really healthy problem to have, because it suggests that the city is back. And I think what we can now do is keep UK guarantees, but increasingly focus them down on targeted areas like nuclear, where the private sector can't do it all on their own. And on the issue of finance, do you think there is still an issue with access to finance for businesses? Because there was that survey recently, wasn't there, from the Manufacturing Advisory Service about um, the number of, uh, around half of manufacturers wanted to invest in the last six months but weren't able to? So I think if you move away from infrastructure to business investment more generally and access to finance, one of my frustrations in crawling the corridors of Westminster has been... MPs talk about things that they get letters in their post bags about. And they get loads of letters from very small businesses that have been challenged in this financial new normal in getting bank loans simply because they're in high-risk sectors like property or retail. And they are no longer having relationship banking. They've got a sector algorithm in the head office of a bank which sends out an automatic letter saying whether you're eligible or not to a loan. I think that problem is lessening as everybody swims upwards, but it's still there. But my point isn't that that's not important. Mm. My point has always been that's not the only issue. So as you go on the business growth cycle, that's the first problem you face. You then move from being an S to an M, my medium-sized business, and then you have a need for patient capital, long-term capital that sticks with the business long enough for the business to grow, whether it be debt or whether it be equity. You then get a big order in a market like China or Brazil, and you need much more complicated financial instruments around bond and hedging, where you're suddenly dealing with a form of banking you've never needed to deal with before, and you need export finance, the old ECGD, to help you out. There's pinch points on access to finance throughout the life cycle of a business, never never mind before you hit big infrastructure, where the issues are very specialist, But I do think things are getting better. Mm. Generally, in CBI's very important and influential economic trend surveys, access to finance is not now above its historical trend rate as a constraint on growth. That's good to hear. The other thing I want to talk to you about is the the EU referendum. That's hanging over our heads at the moment. I feel like every day I'm talking about another boss who's given an opinion on it, you know, Airbus, JCB, Deutsche Bank, HSBC. What, what difference do you think it's going to make? Because it creates uncertainty, doesn't it? It does create uncertainty, uh, but businesses live with uncertainty. Indeed, a lot of what you're discussing at this conference is how business navigates a way through political uncertainty and political risk. And I'd say this, I'd rather be in the climate we're in today where we have an excellent economic platform and the challenges we're facing are the challenges of getting politicians aligned with the opportunity rather than where we were in 2010 through 2013, where what was dominating corporate risk registers was commercial risk and the lack of commercial opportunity. On the EU referendum, I'm an optimist on this. I think we have a very clear plan 
for getting a better deal from Europe. I think business knows exactly what it wants. It's a bit like a Cridland end of term report 40 years ago. Um, they used to say, when I was good, I was very, very good, and when I was bad, I was awful. Europe's a bit like that to me. It's a bit Marmite-ish. What we want is Europe to do more of what it does well and less of what it does badly. What it does well is opening markets up. So let's have more market access. Let's have a digital single market and get that over the line in the next 18 months. Let's have a free trade deal with America and create an 800 million consumer market and then get behind the slogan, Buy America, instead of Buy, Amer Buy Atlantic, sorry, instead of Buy American. We can create more market access that gives British workers and British families more living standard improvement and job security. And let's get Europe to do less of what it does badly. Less regulation, less environmental regulation, less employment regulation. And let's align the Eurozone with the only financial capital that Europe has, London, that isn't going to be in the Eurozone, and where we just need to reconcile the ins and the outs. I think that's what business wants. I think the Prime Minister can bring home the bacon on that. So I like to focus on the reform package and then I think the referendum isn't as much of an issue. Mm. And talking about Eurozone ins and outs, Greece is obviously another one. And what's been interesting about that is a lot of businesses saying to me how they're worried about the strength of the pound and how, because the euro looks like it's in a bit of a meltdown at the moment, who knows what's going to happen next, um, the pound is getting stronger and that's obviously putting pressure on our exports and things. So generally, I think our economic position is very, very strong. And I think the recovery is broadly based and deeply rooted. And indeed, you know, in an economy where 80% of our economy is actually in the service sector, small businesses in the service sector are flying. The challenge for our manufacturing exporters is appreciation of sterling. And that is absolutely dampening prospects. And that's partly because of things we wanted. We wanted more QE in the Eurozone from Mr. Draghi in order to get European growth levels up, and European growth levels generally are improving, and that's had an impact on sterling. But Greece has not helped. And, you know, one feels desperately sorry for people in Greece, because whichever route they choose in the referendum on Sunday, it just involves pain, doesn't it? It's either pain of austerity in the Eurozone or pain of austerity outside the Eurozone. So our first thoughts, frankly, have to be with a very difficult situation Greece has got into. Our direct exposure to Greece is remarkably modest, yeah. less than half a percent of UK exports. But I am very worried about the risk of contagion. So you've got the economic risk of how the markets react and then what that means for sterling. But you've got the political risk of other countries on which the UK is much more dependent economically, Italy and France seeing contagion, political contagion, because of what is happening in Greece. Mm. So I am bothered about Greece, and I just hope that even at this 12th hour, we can all manage to pull back from the brink. Okay. Um, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to ask a question to John? Yes. John Melrose, SPX. The political conversation that we seem to have at the moment, a lot is about not passing on debt to future generations. Do you think it's possible to move that conversation on to where politicians understand better that projects such as Hinkley Point C and Nuclear New Build generally, that's how we'll pass on a better situation to future generations, not just not passing on debt? Seems that there's just not that conversation. Do you think we can make that happen? So I have a good debate with George Osborne about this. And part of my job in these incredibly complicated scientific and technical debates that you're having, rightly, is to identify the high-level governing thought which is most important. And for me, all the research I've ever seen says that if you want to grow an economy in the long term for the benefit of everybody in society, you invest in two things. You invest in infrastructure, and you invest in education. And I can't be satisfied when on both of those, we are well down the league tables. 
and on the World Economic Forum Infrastructure League table, we're 27th. That simply isn't a good enough position. And I think in both cases, education and infrastructure, what a lot of businesses are doing is remedial. We're putting right things that should have been got right first time. And so always it's a challenge for politicians. In an age of austerity, it's much easier to cut capital spending than it is to cut current spending. Politicians always make the same mistake and then regret it. But I would say, in all credit to George Osborne, I talk to him a lot about investing in infrastructure and a lot about investing in education. And in both cases, it's much more than money alone. And I think he recognizes the need. And I think over time, a government moves on. We can't forget dealing with debt. We're still pretty indebted. Half of the cuts government needs to make, it still needs to make. It made all the capital cuts it planned in the last parliament. It's only made half of the current cuts. And for many UK local authorities, the idea that half of the work's still to be done is pretty tough for them because the low-hanging fruit's been taken. So we're going to need to be much more imaginative. But you're right, for the next five years, the CBI's got to focus on investment and delivery of infrastructure. And if you'll allow me, investment and delivery of education. Okay, thanks, John. I know you need to go. Just one final question. You've um, announced that you're stepping down yes. as boss of the CBI. What's the next plan for you? Um, my wife says I need a plan. Right. So I say, remember, dear, I'm a man. I can only do one thing at once. <laughs> so I'm on the bridge at the CBI till the 15th of November, yeah. and then I'll give it some thought. Yeah, well, good luck. Thank you. you do next. Thank you very much. John Quidlin there. <laughs>